Thank you very much. It's an honour and a a pleasure to be here, but if I may just give some context to to the paper. It's important to understand that this paper comes from an Anglo-Saxon political settlement that in some ways is still very foreign to to Europeans. where the, in, where the old divides of right and left are in some ways far more maintained. So if I may, what, what I'd like to do is, is just briefly sketch for you what's happened in, in America and more intensely in Britain and why it's a problem and why it's going to happen everywhere else. Um, and basically what I want to contend broadly speaking, is that liberalism has destroyed the traditions of both conservatism and socialism. And liberalism has done this because, you know, in one minor sense, we're all liberal in the sense that we all believe in a critique of absolute power. And insofar as the philosophers of the Enlightenment uh, criticised the absolute power of the uh, state, as identified with the divine rights of the monarch, then everybody felt they were liberal. But uh, as such, then, liberalism is a parasitic philosophy. It doesn't emerge sui generis from itself. And it's a philosophy that's parasitic upon paradigms of the good life, paradigms of notions of excellence that it wishes to distribute, and so on and so forth. But the problem emerges when liberalism itself becomes the absolute power. And I want to suggest that in the Anglo-Saxon economies or societies, this is what's happened in the post-war settlement. Now, the reason why it's interesting, particularly in Britain, is in Britain we're kind of the most destroyed nation. Um, We have the highest rates of abortions, highest rates of STDs, highest rates of one-parent families, lowest rates of marriage, one of the most secular, not the most secular, that's Iceland and East Germany. Um, um, Nearly 50% of our children will soon be born out of wedlock. Um, We have the lowest rates of social mobility in the developed world. We're the most indebted nation in the world, both personally and corporately. Um, What else can I go on about? (laughs) There are so many things. Um, And and this is very peculiar because undoubtedly we, in some ways, have the best history in Europe at least. Um, While the whole of Europe, with some honourable exceptions on the part of individuals, and the Danes who rescued their Jewish population in an act of moral virtue that, according to Hannah Arendt, I don't know whether this is true, humbled the Ebo captain so they didn't intercede, But largely speaking, um, the whole of Europe fell into fascist and racist politics, but the British didn't. And the British didn't because they had a civic account of what it was to be British. In that sense, they were the continuance of Rome, really, in the sense of refusing any blood identification of what it is to be British. So how did we, we emerge from the Second World War? I mean, kind of economically broken, but but not historically and not morally, and well, far from it, really. And yes, we now sort of have the most successful economy, but we have the most destroyed society. So, so what's happened? And what I broadly speaking want to outline to you is, is how something called neoliberalism has metastasized and become hypermodern and has essentially destroyed... Um, the European model, which you're still working with, and I also know that in a way the European model is is under assault um, by similar forces. Now, I want to suggest, roughly speaking, that it is the left that first went right wing. And the left first went right wing, um, and the left was right wing before the right was, in Britain through two two moments. The post-45 embrace of the state, and the post-68 embrace of the individual. The embrace of the state in Britain kind of, and I'll outline this in uh, the chapters I'm going to read from. The state in Britain and the left-wing socialist embrace of the state 
in essence destroyed all intermediate or working, working class communities and essentially made the poor dependent on, made the poor a supplicant class dependent on state benefits. I'll give the history of that. Secondly, the, the left went libertarian in 68, in the late 1960s, when it embraced rampant individualism as somehow the, the true panacea and the answer to all, to all problems. Individual self-realization, tune in, turn on, drop out, essentially pursue your own goals. Um, in that sense, Mick Jagger really is the epitome of, of the horror that, that Britain fell into. And I don't know if you know Welbeck's novel. In French, it's Les, Les Elements Particulaires. In English, it's translated as atomized. But I think that's a brilliant, brilliant novel of the impact of libertarian culture. It's, it's on France. But imagine if that became wholly dominant. That's how to think of, of, um, of what happened to the English. And then the failure of of those sort of those sort of approaches taken by the left, then created the conditions for Mrs. Thatcher and neoliberalism. Remember, Mrs. Thatcher was elected in '79. Reagan wasn't until '81. You know, the British, unfortunately, in this regard, really were the beginnings of of the neoliberal ascendancy. Now, this matters for you for the following reasons. You kind of think, what's he talking about Britain for? It's nothing to do with me. Well, it kind of does, because if you look at GDP, the golden age for the ordinary waged worker was between 1945 and uh, 1973. As a percentage of GDP, that's when the ordinary waged worker got the highest level of income. Essentially, between 1973 and now, the share of wealth enjoyed by the worker has been either stagnant, depending where you are on the income curve, or falling. In the United States, the wage of a skilled manual laborer, these are people who are good at what they do, is 10% lower. No, sorry, that's a lie. 15% lower than it was 10 years ago in real terms. And these, are, um, these figures are repeated uh, depending what income group um, you're in. Now, all of this matters because, you know, until very recently, until the present financial crisis, which I can talk about in a bit uh, as to where that's going, all of this matters because, um, because it's coming to visit you, you, you know, albeit uh, in an unrecognized form. And I understand that this is already happening under Rasmussen in, in Denmark. You're already seeing rising inequalities, the top 10% benefiting the next 30% becoming highly indebted through asset speculation on housing, and the bottom, uh, it depends quite where, 40 or 60, doing, getting their baskets of goods that they can buy with their wages, getting increasingly attenuated. So I want to suggest that there's something wrong with our whole present political paradigm. And... One way to uh, express that is that all of my left-wing friends, I think, are right-wing. Virtually all of them in Britain. None of them are truly left-wing. Why? Because what they primarily privilege is autonomy. What they primarily privilege is their own identity. They love abortion, not because they love the practice itself, because it's an ultimate proof of autonomy, and therefore it should be defended at all costs. They uh, view any limit on what they want to do as somehow a violation of their true nature, but they think fox hunting is really, really terrible and, and should be banned immediately and anyone who does it in prison. Um, and then all my right-wing friends, of which there's not that many, um, are not conservative at all. They don't believe in preserving anything. They merely believe in market forces. And when have market forces ever conserved or preserved anything? Capital changes all things. Marx was at least right on this. Um, it turns all that's solid into earth. It changes all relationships. How can somebody who's a conservative, and I'm a conservative, how can somebody who's a conservative who believes in tradition, virtue culture, widely distributed property, uh, stability of communities, 
uh, time as redemption, the longevity of institutions, believe in capitalism. Capitalism destroys all that. It individuates all that and makes uh, the sight of the good nothing other than individualistic will and assertion. So in that sense, this whole project comes out of um, a kind of a common thesis as to the covert alliance between the left and the right that um, certainly has been present in, in England. And if you go and speak at the BBC, which, which I do, and speak to the cultural elite, they're all neoliberals, but they all think they're left wing. They all, they're all social and cultural libertarians who kind of like the free market because their house price has gone up until recently. Um, but because they like to think of themselves as the left wing, they support the welfare state because that's a moral proxy for them. And then the right wing people are even kind of more, they are just more self-aware versions of the same. That they essentially believe in nothing but the hegemony of market forces because they kind of worship power and they believe themselves to be relatively high up in it and that the, uh, the wealth they think generally accrues downwards in spite of the fact that there's no such evidence for any trickle down ever, anywhere. And actually, uh, least of all to the poor. So that's what this whole project comes out of. That's what red Toryism right, is speaking to. Now, why red and why Tory? Red, because um, what I believe in is that I believe in the good and I think it should be distributed to all, to everybody. I believe in the democratization of excellence. And that excellence is spiritual, it's moral, it's social, and it's material. So in terms of property, I believe in widely distributed property. In terms of familial structures, I think the evidence is very clear that stable families are best for children, for example. So, the, the, so I'm red in a sense I believe in a good that is distributed to all. But I'm a Tory in a sense that I believe that that good is in some sense hierarchical. I believe in the better over the worse. It believes in the privileging of certain traditions over others. And it's in some sense radically conserving. It's conserving of um, what we already have, what, it's recovering what we used to have, and it's a permanent reflection upon um, that which is best and how we might instantiate it again. So anyway, that's broad brush strokes. And this is a broad brush book. What I'm about to read to you is a, is a polemical popular book. Um, I, well, at least I hope it will be popular, it might be wildly unpopular. But it's an attempt to try and convert a nation, um, I mean that, as ridiculous as it sounds, to, um, to a different sort of ideology, because, I mean, you're not British, but, but I am, and to see what's happened to, to the cultures and country I believe in is, is a truly di dispiriting experience. So I'll begin. And if you get the sense that this is uh, coming from Britain, and this is um, an analysis of what's gone wrong, hopefully you'll, if I have some interest for you. Something has gone seriously wrong with Britain. This is an intuition that everybody uh, who's British, whatever their politics shares. But what is it? We know the signs. Increasing and ever more dangerous violent crime, loneliness, Long-term financial insecurity, family breakup, divorce, infidelity, general social hostility, bureaucratic and unresponsive public services, dirty hospitals, powerlessness, the return of racism, paperwork, always more paperwork, longer and longer working hours, women without children, men without women, women without men, children without parents. You laugh, but this is true. 50% of all women in Britain with degrees will not have children. Um, and that's not out of choice. Um, abortion, sexual disease, concentrated uh, poverty, rising inequality, lack of politeness, aggressive youths, civil liberties or lack thereof, public authoritarianism, private libertarianism, general pointlessness, political cynicism, social suspicion, and lack of daily joy. That's kind of my country. I could go on, but it would only encourage despair, and that is never good. <laughs> never good politics, or indeed um, wise judgment. 
But let us, whatever our political beliefs, admit that something in Britain is seriously awry. This intuition is not just a private opinion held by a disgruntled few, but a public discernment widely shared though seldom addressed. The inability of current politics to successfully tackle these issues requires serious reflection. Certainly all parties engage in ever more ferocious PR about measures to tackle violent youths, ineffective bureaucracies, or absent policemen, but none of the measures ever really amounts to much, nor do they seem to arrest the social trends that produce such dreadful outcomes. As a result, we have a widening gap between the public and contemporary, poli between public and contemporary politics. This has a number of dangerous consequences. It's not just that racist and fascist parties, and I know you have them in Denmark, grow and prosper in the face of widespread working class estrangement, nor is it the mere fact of declining participation in political elections. No, it's more serious and more ubiquitous than both. This gap between the politics of the elites and general mass disaffection reflects and is caused by a wholesale collapse of British culture. Now, I think what, what's interesting about this, to move it on to a meta level, is that the only real resistance to capital is culture. It's not the organized working class. It's not the revolutionary moment. It's not the eroticism of the spectacle. It, it's not the set of all sets. It's not difference. It's not difference. It's none of these things. It's high culture. High culture is the only resistance to capital. Because it's only culture that determines what capital can exchange, what capital, how capital can operate, what it can do and what it can't. And it's high culture become mass culture. So we actually look at Japan and, yeah, we think capital's the same. It really wasn't, not until the crisis of the late 1990s. The salaryman was a commitment to a Japanese variant of Keynesian full employment. Um, similarly, the paleo, paleo, not so paleo, corporatist model in Germany, or indeed your own country, of employment rights and the notion of a of distributing the, the profits equitably really matters. So capital must make a war on culture. It must make a war on a binding mass culture, fragment the binding mass culture, and introduce individuated culture. Then capital can destroy culture in the name of culture. And that's what happens. That's what it does. And it usually does this by middle class elite groups. Right? So if you wanted to end a, a nation, all you have to do is set up a disco, get the elite to go, introduce Western sexual mores, and within about a decade, the culture that's lasted 2,000 years will be finished. <laughs> and unfortunately, I think that's def a defensible thesis. So what's interesting, I think, then, for political theorists to think about, or both left and right, is, is think of culture as the form of resistance. When I say culture as a form of resistance, I don't mean something... Like, we go to Wagner and they don't. I mean something that collective, that kind of binds the whole nation into some sort of common reflection on, on what it is and what it isn't. So when I say that British culture has collapsed, we again, whatever our political beliefs, I'm speaking to a British audience, obviously, almost immediately recognise the truth of it. Our parents will tell us that things really were better before, that children really were polite, that people really did all know one another, and that, yes, whole families really did stay together and form lasting bonds with their relations and their neighbours. In response, lecturers in cultural studies departments, I'm sure it's no different here, will claim that everybody has always thought that things were better in the past and that we are consumed by false nostalgia and fake memories. Historically, however, we now know that our elders, who for the most part are our betters, were right. Though some things were clearly worse, poverty and general health, many things were better in the past, familial security and human association. And that by denying their memories, we are denying ourselves the, rec the recollection of a better and nobler recent history. The loss of culture is evinced in other ways. Perhaps it is best understood as the disappearance of British civic society. By civic society, I mean everything that ordinary citizens do that is not reducible to the imposed activities of the central state or the compulsion and determination of the marketplace. So conceived, it appears that we are now in a flat society. By this, I mean there are only two powers in our country, the state and the marketplace. 
All other sources of independent autonomous influence have been crushed. We no longer have, in any effective independent manner, local government, churches, trade unions, cooperative societies, publicly funded educational institutions, civic organisations, or indeed locally organised groups that operate on the basis of more than single issues. Whatever these various institutions represent now, what they embodied in the past were the means by which ordinary people exercised power. These associations helped to give form and direction to human beings. They allowed parents to craft their families and citizens to shape their communities. Nowadays, however, all such sources of independent power have been eroded. Instead, these civil spaces have either vanished or become subject domains of the state and the marketplace. Like a perfectly conceived battle plan, the states and the markets have advanced pincer-like on virtually all the self-governing domains that previously constituted civil society in Britain. So you see the thesis I'm saying that both the left and right have destroyed community. Now, why do I say that? Because the, both the left and right are liberal. What's the essence of liberal thought? It cannot think community. What, what liberal thought has, and all that liberal thought offers, is a world of autonomous, potentially warring individuals who are either brought to peace via contractualist theories or by a centralised state. All liberalism thinks is a hyper-centralised state and a world of desire-ridden individuals who cannot form common cause with anything. And that, in a way, is the legacy of, of the left and the right. The right produces an economy of, um, of the individual space, permanently stimulating, permanently fragmenting, permanently unbinding. And the state, the left, also, as it were, thinks itself as policing that through providing its own variant of the social. But they're completely allied. They're part of the same phenomena and should be understood as such. So, by finding civil society unbearably local, uneconomic or uneven, the market state, which is what I call it, was able to control and determine its character and so abolish genuine participation in society. This uncritical alliance between the state and the market is highly peculiar. In a uniquely Anglo-Saxon fashion, it was decided shortly after Mrs. Thatcher's election in 1979 that the interests of the state and the market were synonymous. Why both England and America view this state of affairs as desirable is unclear. Just about the only other country that holds a sim similar belief is communist China. We can see the consequence of this on our own high streets. British towns, and American towns for that matter, far from being different expressions of region and locality, are dreadful uniform consumer zones that are indistinguishable from one another. Small businesses put off by high business rents cannot get a foothold as large retail concerns command the economies of scale, and so dictate the presence and shape of every high street and shopping centre. This impacts on the local economy as money is drained from the provinces to feed the corporate centre, and we, all, we are all made into passive clients of a commerce that has no local distinction or allegiance. Smaller farmers, exhausted by the price control of the large supermarkets, give up and surrender their fields to those who pra practice the pesticide monoculture, that their resultant land monopoly permits. Even one trip abroad to France or Germany, this is revolutionary for Britain, by the way, this is why this is in here. One trip abroad to France or Germany will show that this arrangement need not pertain. For over there, in spite of being foreign or perhaps because of it, they still have what one can call a society, and they still practice public expressions of a diverse culture. Partly this is because the Continentals decided that the interests of the state and the market don't necessarily coincide. Traditionally, they had seen the role of the state as that of protecting and sheltering the nation from the extremes of market monopolization and fluctuation. Moreover, both Germany's federalist system and France's republican tradition ensured there was a healthy plurality of political power in the country and a balance between centre and periphery. This structural political complexity combined with the view that the interest of the state differs from that of the marketplace, has ensured that civic society is both required and desired. This obligation has clear structural underpinnings. The lowest tier of government in France is the Commune. It has an average population of 1,580. Germany's lowest tier is 
4,925. The British average is 118,400. Little wonder then that British people are unable to control their own communities. Smaller units of political democracy have been progressively abolished by the central state for reasons of administrative ease and cost effectiveness. However, this crisis is not just a matter of political structure, abstract theories and debates about things that don't impinge on ordinary life. The crisis of civil society impacts upon us in the most intimate way. We are lonelier than at any other time in recorded history. We increasingly live by ourselves, fail to have children, and when we do marry or cohabit, it is for less time than at any stage since records began. The extended family has been destroyed, a development foolishly welcomed by the unreflective post-Engels left, and now the nuclear one is vanishing as well. The vast majority of us just work and go home to whatever household we've managed to pull off. We exercise little or no power within our own communities. We work within parameters established by others according to agendas imposed from above. Most of us avoid voting at local elections, and less than half manage to make it to the polls for national ones. We would rather be stuck at home watching friends than making any. So what then is my general thesis? Simply put is that British civic society, which is the source and wellspring of our culture, has been flattened, it's a polemical piece for Britain, so I do apologise, has been flattened by the unleashed authoritarianism of the state and the unrestricted reign granted to the market. But something had to unleash the state, and something had to give free rein to the market in order for these powers to break free of all limits and moral restraint. Our society had to collapse from within. A stronger civic culture would have permitted modernization and technological development without sacrificing its social foundations. A more active and participatory civic culture would never have let the, destroy, the state destroy every other alternate source of power. Other equally developed and somewhat more advanced countries have not experienced a social collapse on anything like the British scale. Japan still maintains traditional values, often against the demands of the market, precisely because its civil culture will accept nothing less. Similarly, most Germans will still not cross the road without a green light, in spite of being, if anything, more technically advanced than ourselves. The Spanish, even after the hideous train bombing sponsored by Al-Qaeda, has not brought in any new oppressive laws, nor has Spain abandoned its hard-won liberties. But in Britain we have achieved none of those things. As listless and indifferent, we slide into the post-democratic culture of passive consumption and political acquiescence. Now I think this is also relevant for you, um, and I appreciate your own thoughts. Um, Scandinavia is often lauded in Britain as the model, the social democratic model that we should all follow. And the people who do this are left-wing people who hate community. Um, you know, and are busy trying to, I don't know, sleep with each other's wives and break up as many families as they can. And what, what's interesting, what seems to me, and it's anecdotal, and you must tell me what's true, is that a lot, a lot, the whole Scandinavian model rests upon the fact that you all seem to regard each other as kind of brothers and sisters, as part of a civic associational compact. And one of the reasons the neoliberal rice ring control is immigrant centred your society at quite a high degree of um, penetration, the left wing government that was in power when that happened ignored that for reasons of political um, correctness. And then because you as a culture felt that something was happening at a scale and degree that was unprecedented, these uh, new incomers weren't regarded as members of the same civic association. And because they weren't regarded as members of the same civic association, you voted for the neo-right under, under a new alliance that promised to restrict those sort of entries and defend, defend this association. And the sense I get from Sweden and from Norway is that similar moves were afoot. And what's interesting about this is, is it's only neoliberalism that has driven the immigration agenda. It's big business and capital that wants immigration to undercut wages and to undercut um, um, essentially labour labor power. Marx's thesis of a reserve uh, army of labour sort of has some pertinence here. 
Now, what's interesting about, about this is, is in Britain, that civic association was destroyed. Now, what's interesting that might happen to Scandinavia, it seems, is by not extending citizenship to your immigrants, uh, um, citizens, and by failing to kind of form new bonds of association, you will do, as it were, the neo rights work for them. You'll start to fragment. You'll start to do, destroy your own society through notions of who is in and who isn't in, which is actually what they've done in France. Because it's almost no more racist country than the French. Um, if you actually look at the figures, I'm, I'm being serious, if you look at the level of penetration of the Algerian Muslim class, I think they're nearly 10% of the French population now, just under. Huge barriers to work. Yet they have no indigenous um, terror movements. Why? Because they want to be French. If you actually look at, if you look at the, uh, if, if these kids from you know, the suburbs are interviewed, they always say we want to be French and the French won't let us. And they engage in civic disturbance, which is a very French tradition. It's fine if it's practiced by students from the Ecole Normale Supérieure, but if it's done by people from the suburbs, it's really rather awful. Yeah requires, you know, lethal injunction. Um, and what's interesting there is the French are beginning to divide their own nation against themselves because they won't admit this population that wants to be French into being French. And I fear that the same process is, is at work in Scandinavia. So you actually might lose your compact by denying it to others. Now, I'm not saying that the immigrant class that comes in doesn't have to in some sense, become like you. It does. That's the point. I mean, what's interesting, the countries with the worst um, Islamic problem are, the, are multicultural nations. My country has a huge problem of indigenous Islamic uh, militancy, as does Holland. Why? Because they pursue a multicultural solution. A multicultural solution is, is completely disastrous because it allows separate development. State multiculturalism allows the separate development of communities and the failure to produce a compact. So let me, what I'm trying to say to you is fundamental to any form of society worth living in is a binding, conservative, social compact that extends to war. That's fundamental. What destroys this is forces from the left that preach autonomy and desire and the state and forces from the right that sort of interview large numbers of migrant labor and levels that can't be absorbed and then tell you not to deal with it. So what I'm trying to suggest is a, a pan lesson here that what's absolutely crucial to any sense of community is a community. And it's fractured at different countries but for different reasons along, along different lines. And therefore the key task of, of what would be a stabilizing and therefore a truly radical and anti-capitalist politics should be a conservative politics, wouldn't be a left-wing politics. Why? Because, because I don't believe a left-wing politics can produce by itself, it can in conjunction, but by itself it can't produce a stabilised society. So that's what I, I think one of the first lessons that we might talk about, and I'd be very interested in, in your own reflections on, on where you think the Scandinavian model's going, because on socioeconomic data it's already over in Denmark, so there's lots of overhangs. All your rights will gradually be eroded over the next 10 years. So your children won't have what you have, and it will be normal for them. Okay, anyway, let, let, me, let me go on. Um, okay, now one cannot have a culture or a civil society from the top down. If it is only the elite that are cultured, you will have an oligarchy that calls itself civilized while denying others a similar benefit. Similarly, though one can have, and we do, a mass civilization with a minority or virtually non-existent culture. There is no reason to deny the existence of a higher civilization or the possibility of mass participation in it. What I want to argue, contrary to both extremes, is that a high mass culture did exist in Britain in the 19th century, that it was achieved by the working class, and indeed that it existed at several points in our history. Thus, in calling for its resurrection, I am being neither ahistorical nor hopelessly romantic. Rather, what seems to be both, a historical and romantic, that is, is the belief that we can survive without a society being made civil by a higher culture that is shared in all and enriched by all. 
The English have always benefited from having a relatively organic culture. Our nation, despite its contested history, has never fatally divided over ideology. And I say it, the English because if it wasn't for the English, you'd just have Scottish sectarianism and Welsh sectarianism. The nation that takes you over is the nation that forms a non-racial account of empire. You know, it's not incidental that the Romans took over everybody else, often in quite brutal ways. But then they formed the first non-racial uh, account of what it was to be a political entity. So empire has a very ambiguous inheritance, I think. <clears throat> this is no small achievement, the fact that the British didn't divide over ideology. One reason why all of Europe fell into fascist or communist politics was because of this divide between left and right. A separate and separated European elite despised and feared its mass peasant and proletarian populations. Right-wingers retreated into narrow nationalistic and racial hierarchies to defend the status quo, while the European left, increasingly transnational, prophesied at their downfall and called for the establishment of a new world order where nothing would be preserved and all the old verities would be destroyed. Thus was Europe divided between two mutually exclusive traditions, where each earnestly sought the destruction of its opposite. Between these two extremes, Britain managed to chart a more virtuous course. Any visit to an Oxbridge college, where the names of the student dead from the world wars are inscribed on the walls, will show you that the British elite died in as great a number as the poor, and any study of the letters from the front, written by the British Tommy, the ordinary soldier, shows that the working classes also died to defend a specifically British version of a better world. Culturally speaking, the British have more often than not denied that the separation between the classes spoke of a more fundamental divide between them as men. Before the BBC was betrayed by the contemporary managers, there were giants like John Reith who did not believe in choice. This is an interesting point. He didn't believe in choice, but in equal access to things that are great, uh, which is the, the only really pub basis on which any public service should be run. A tradition that extends back to Shakespeare, Marlowe, and all the other Elizabethan playwrights, all of whom spoke to both commoners and aristocrats. It was only with Charles II's inauguration and the advent of Restoration comedies after the English Revolution that we started to get an art form designed exclusively for the aristocrats and for the courts. And these writings could never stand against the genius of the poet warrior Milton, or his legacy as personified in William Blake, Shelley, Coleridge, or Keats. No, our culture at its best has always spoken to all of us, and from the highest to the lowest, it has always called us to a universal vision of a shared commonwealth. And despite what one sees or thinks today, those at the bottom used to have a very vivid cultural life indeed. Before the Industrial Revolution, people were not, as Marx supposed, living lives of rural idiocy and mindless feudalism. There was a rich and vibrant agrarian culture, coupled with domestic production of finished goods in the market towns and cities. There really was a prosperous and happy British peasantry, a condition destroyed by the Industrial Revolution and the resulting enclosures. Now, what, um, what I want to describe now is, um, is perhaps kind of a, another interesting question, and that's the origin of capitalism. Oh, okay. Now, According to the most famous living Marxist historian, Robert Brenner, who's just published a book called Merchants and Revolution and is the centre of the very important agrarian um, uh, capitalism debate, capitalism began in England. And it began in England roughly with the beginning of the enclosure movement. And the enclosure movement happened with the Tudors. And what the enclosure movement was, was driving peasants, self-sufficient peasants, off the land into, in order to um, vastly enhance the, uh, the land holdings of the aristocratic class. And so the proletariat, and the proletariat is those who, have only to, who can only sell their labour to survive, and they have no other means of subsistence, was actually created by driving the agrarian subsistence, well, they were more than the 
subsistence. The agrarian subsistence farmers off the land into the towns to create that reserve army of labour that I mentioned earlier. Now this this matters because um, it helps to explain why people are poor. Between 1750 and 1850 in in Britain, over 7.5 million acres of common land had been lost to private enclosure. The agrarian peasant class who had previously farmed this land were driven from it into the large and expanding cities. The working poor, deprived of security and livelihood, drifted to the large urban cities. There they formed the landless, dispossessed mass that we now call the working class. This newly created industrial proletariat were in a dire situation. Indigent, indigent and powerless, they relied on subsistence factory wages for survival. All the familial and social structures that had sustained them throughout the previous centuries had been erased. They either had to build them anew or utterly succumb to the new economic order. Indeed, these new industrial workers are a people whose intellectual and political qualities have been much maligned. When John Kerry uh, charts and hears the intellectuals and the masses, the all too typical story of intellectual and aristocratic distaste of mass proletarian culture, he himself falls into this paradigm when he writes the difference between the 19th century mob and the 20th century mass is literacy. Leaving aside the fact that 20th century political achievements were the result of the activities and organisations of 19th century workers, we also forget an earlier and more radical peasant history. The English had their revolution in the 17th century, over 130 years earlier than the rest of Europe, and this itself was coupled with levels of literacy they were not equaled until the beginning of the 20th century. And if only at the Putney Marshes in 1647, the levellers had not lost to Cromwell's defence of the landing-owning classes, who alone had a permanent interest, then the history of Britain would have been very different indeed. Now, given that the collapse of our civil culture is most evident, though not necessarily most present, in the working-class sinker states that surround our cities, I start with working-class culture, but I begin with what it was as opposed to what it became. E.P. Thompson began his celebrated work, The Making of the English Working Class, with an account of the inauguration of the London Corresponding Society in 1792. The society, a working-class association dedicated to extending the electoral franchise, consisted of working people, weavers, shoemakers, and tradesmen who campaigned for electoral reform, by writing to one another and engaging in public debate. Wildly popular, they were viciously repressed by the British government, with their members being indicted for high treason. Victory finally seemed to be established with the Great Reform Act of 1832, which still partially extended the franchise. Still, of course, those who were wholly without property were excluded. In response, the Chartist movement campaigned vigorously for another 25 years for the enfranchisement of the poor and access to political powers. Now, the great achievement of these um, movements is thought to be the the welfare state. So everybody on the left thinks the welfare state is um, is a great social achievement. And this came to, into being um, in 1945. I want to argue, however, that the working welfare state has gone astray. And the chief reason why the welfare state went astray was that the governing elite imposed a bureaucratic and centralised vision of the caring state upon a working class that wished for something far more radical, more, more mutual and more empowering. All existing working class welfare organisations, then existent, were sidelined by a universal entitlement guaranteed by the state based on a centralised accounts of need. Local requirements, organisations or practices were simply ignored and thus rendered redundant. As such, I will argue that the welfare state began the destruction of the independent life of the British working class. Now, I'm roundly attacked by this, by lots of left-wing people. But it, all the old Marxists have always said this, that the welfare state is a panacea. It doesn't ever meet the problems of the poor. It uh, certainly doesn't solve them. It doesn't get them out of poverty. Indeed, you could argue that it actually traps them in poverty because it 
renders them permanently powerlessness. For instance, the new configuration of state and citizen made the populace a supplicant citizenry. That means a citizenry that relies on its welfare from, from above, dependent on the state rather than themselves, and it supported indigenous traditions of working class self-help, mutuality, and social insurance. Rather than working with one another in order to change their situation or their locality, relying on the welfare state only to get them through a temporary rough patch, working class people increasingly became permanent passive recipients of centrally determined benefits. As such, welfare ceased to function as a safety net through which people could not fall, becoming instead a ceiling through which the supplicant class, cut off from earlier working class ambition and aspiration, could not break. This benefits culture can be tied directly to the thwarting of working class ambition by a middle class elite that formed the machinery of the welfare state, yes, to alleviate poverty, but also to deprive the poor of their irritating habit of autonomous and successful organisation. So what I'm saying is that um, when we go around many of our western cities today and you find an underclass who are kind of fragmented and isolated, trapped on benefits and unable to escape, part of that is, it's not the sole reason, but part of it is that the welfare state has destroyed the communities within which these people would have had far more power. The welfare state atomizes community. It says community isn't necessary. We will give you aid just on the basis of your individuality, regardless of community. And so what in effect happens is that um, community itself is rendered superfluous. When actually all of human history tells you that the fundamental reason working class people come together is for communal self-help. And all the great achievements of working class people are always achieved through community. So the very thing the middle class left set up uh, to save working class people destroyed working class people. Why? And I repeat, because it destroyed community. Now I'm not saying of necessity, I'm not a neoliberal, I'm not saying of necessity this has to happen, but this is the mix that has happened, and has happened in, in Britain and arguably elsewhere. Disempowered with their own social lives increasingly formed around a centralised state that imposed its own solutions on them, working class people had no way to influence the state that had been made in their name. This was more than events when the welfare state began in the 1960s to destroy the extended family. And that sounds like right-wing rhetoric, doesn't it? That sounds like rubbish. You know, what nonsense is he talking? It's actually true. Very interesting book called The New East End. And in Britain... There really were white working class communities where people uh, left their door open because there was a tradition of public housing. And in public housing, you got the house by the waiting list. So as soon as you had children as a council house tenant, you put your kids on the waiting list. And in time, someone else in the community would die off and you'd move into the street. So over time, you generated a whole network where everybody literally knew one another. Very little violence. People's doors were open. People genuinely had community in a very real way. Now, the awful thing that happened with, the, um, with immigration in Britain in the 60s is the liberals, middle class elites, said, oh, no, we've got to give housing no longer on the basis of how long you've been on the housing list, on the basis of need. And clearly, these, these poor people from, from the Caribbean, uh, who, this mother's got these two children, you know, they don't have a job. They need housing more than these young, fit, you know, white boys who are sons. So black families then moved into white areas. Now, the awful, terrible legacy of this is that this then created the conditions for inner city racism, which I abhor. But you can understand the white communities who are now denied communities. And so... Kind of, the sons and children of people in those council homes had to go out to the suburbs and leave their grandparents in a community that increasingly became foreign. Then because nobody, because the state doesn't think community and nobody delivers it, you created mutual hostility where previously there, there hadn't been. Quite simply because you, you privilege need above associative community. You actually ended up destroying 
the British working class community, which is one of the most stable in the world, that went over the top and never mutinied and died in vast numbers. You know, and you ended it, you killed it. And this is part of what I'm trying to, and it's most, one of the more controversial aspects, it's part of what I'm trying to argue of how the welfare state functions, because it doesn't think community, and therefore it can't integrate communities. So it can't even create the conditions for integration. And we can talk about how to do this. And let me be very clear, I'm an absolute opponent of racism. So this isn't some quasi-defense. It's an account of why people become racist, and an account of why, um, how we, in part, we must think if we're to avoid these sort of outcomes in the future. You're, you yourself, in your own society, must avoid kind of unthinking liberal political correctness coming up with this sort of solution, because it will only foster widespread social schisms in, in later aspects of, of your society. Okay. In addition, and this is, this is the fun bit, this really upsets people. Um, so well, I want to argue that basically um, so, um, the state, the welfare state, bequeathed the legacy of racism and inner city fragmentation and shattered the vivid communal life of the urbanized white working class. In addition, when in the 1960s the middle class has formed the new left, and this is when it gets really toxic, and preached personal pressure as a means of public salvation, they had little idea what they were doing. While toxic to civilized middle class life, this mixture was lethal to the working class. Sexual liberation meant the dissolving of the social bonds that had kept the poorest together during the worst times of the 1930s. Illegitimacy increased and family breakdown began in earnest. Now, the family is the first and the most intimate social institution that human beings have. It might vary by extension, but nothing can challenge its decisive importance. But just look what has happened to the British family. In 1964, 63,000 births were recorded outside of marriage, only 7.3% of all births. In the 50s, that was less than 1%. Now, Britain's approaching 50% of all births being illegitimate. Now, you might think that doesn't matter, and it's all fine, and what the hell, and everything's great. Let's listen to music. <laughs> But for children, it's a disaster, because on average, the length to which a child of unmarried parents has experience of both parents is three and a half years, whereas the length of, uh, of time at which a child of married parents experiences both parents is 11 and a half years. And this is obviously lethal to any notion of st stable environment, stable upbringing, or formation of children. And increasingly, if, if children are left alone, and are just with one parent, their emotional life is dictated by the television. Because their, their one parent is normally under-subsidized, and has to work, and, and leaves their child in the care of others. And you produce a generation of human beings who are no longer have any it had, no longer had the experience of permanent nurture that seems to be vital to notions of future happiness. So, if present trends continue, the majority of children born in Britain will be illegitimate. Marriage is clearly better for children. But don't worry, marriage is failing, so that's good. Divorce has ridden for the fourth successive year to 167,000. And in 1960, there were only 27,000 divorces granted. The picture isn't pretty. With family breakdown for many, the fundamental bedrock of civic life in Britain has been destroyed. And I haven't even talked about the unprecedented rise in violent crime, the abandonment of the elderly. Over half a million elderly people in Britain live on their own and don't see another soul. Half a million. Or the devastation of working class areas by drug dependency. I'm not always so miserable. It's just, just this novel. <laughs> it was the very people who thought themselves left wing, the pleasure seeking, mind altering drug takers of the 1960s who instigated the fragmentation of the working class family and sold the poor the poisonous idea of liberation through chemical and sexual experimentation. 
Thus it was the left who first opened the personal sphere to modern consumer capitalism. It was the left who commodified sexual relations, and it was the left that abandoned the family for the delights of self-gratification. So constituted the left, formed the very people and the very values that the conservatives spoke so strongly to in the person of Mrs. Thatcher. While the left is open, so I'm arguing that the left is the precondition for neoliberalism. Now, while the left had opened the personal sphere to capitalism, public culture was still constituted by traditional practices and institutions. Mrs. Thatcher elected in 1979 instigated a much needed modernisation of the British economy, of that was no doubt. Unfortunately, however, she threw out the baby with the bathwater by completely surrendering the entirety of British public life and its consequent values to the dictates of neoliberalism. Whole traditions, cultures, in a generation or two were sacrificed to the demands of the markets. If socialists laid waste to the private sphere, which they did, Mrs. Thatcher completed the evisceration of British culture by doing the same in the public realm. The idea that the market was the ultimate arbiter of value and the measure of all things ensured that the interests of the state and the market were viewed as disastrously synonymous. The neoliberalism espoused by Mrs. Thatcher was not quite the innovation it was commonly understood to be. Ted Heath's 1970 manifesto was more Thatcherite than anything ever published by the Iron Lady. Quite apart from the fact that the neoliberals in the Conservative Party never forgave Edward Heath for his corporatist U-turn of 71, Neoliberal values were already established in the private lives and the practices of the emergent British consumer class. In this sense, Thatcher and the 1960s left were already colluding in the reduction of all political questions to the neoliberal maxims of freedom and economic liberalisation. Now, it's probably you probably all need a break after this after this relentless um, litany. So let me just um, sum up, and what I can do, and I think there are alternatives, and I think there are genuine ways to, to progress, and, um, and what I can do after the, the break is talk about them, and then, um, and then answer some questions. But let me try and sum up. So basically what I'm arguing is that, that in essence, in post-war society, that uh, the left and the right have become compromised by the same incredibly damaging liberal philosophy. The essence of liberal philosophy is it doesn't think community. And the left has taken apart uh, community at its base, and the right finished it all off with neoliberal economics. Clearly speaking, the path for resistance to all this is now self-evident, the reforming of community. And something like Red Tory, which is what I'm trying to do, which is a kind of a recovery of what's good in the left and what's good in the right, is, I think, fundamental to a post-neoliberal paradigm. And perhaps that's what we could talk about, what a post-neoliberal paradigm could be. And I've got some ideas on that. But I'll draw it to a, I'll give, you a, give you a break, and thank you very much. Thank you.